Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to see a lot of people in this call about energy efficiency. My name is Glenn, and together with Piotr and Eric, who will introduce themselves in a bit, we will guide you through some energy technologies and challenges. Then for the agenda for today, um, the webinar is split in four parts. Um, in the first part of the webinar, we, and it means EFESO and DB Energy, will introduce ourselves. Uh, we will have an interactive part, so don't hesitate to already take your cell phone close to you. In the second part, we would like to give you a broad overview of the enormous potential within the current operations and run through some concrete technologies, um, which should be on top of mind of a lot of entrepreneurs, site managers, production managers. We hope in this way, in, in the second part, to, to inspire you a little bit. And then, of course, it comes all down to implementing these good ideas. And uh, so in the third part, we would like to have a closer look uh, to how we could implement these ideas in a very practical way. And then finally, at the end of the session, at the end of our webinar, we will conclude with a macroeconomic view and uh, a Q&A. A Q &A. Uh, so quickly introduce ourselves. Um, I'll start. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into the collaboration of EFESO and DB Energy just uh, in a minute, but first introduce myself. I'm a manager within the Brussels office. My name is Glenn Rosé. Um, I've been strongly involved in mainly three topics uh, the last years, project management of different projects, of which energy, for example, operational excellence projects, and I'm also part of the digital community. And uh, I will pass with um, enthusiasm the, the word to Eric um, now. Hello, my name is uh, Eric Weitjens and I'm an associate director in the Brussels office of EFESO. Uh, for those who don't know EFESO, we are a pure play consultancy uh, specializing in what we call building industrial future for our customers. So we do things like uh, operational excellence all over the world. We run transformation programs. We do digitalization projects and we do that out of 30 offices worldwide. Um, today, one of those subjects of uh, building industrial future is the energy. And so that's why we do this uh, webinar with you today. For the field of energy, we work together exclusively with uh, another company, DB Energy, and uh, Piotr Danielski of DB Energy will also introduce himself now. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to meet. Um, my name is Piotr Danielski. I'm the co founder and vice president. and. Chief Technology Officer of DB Energy. And DB Energy is a big group of enthusiastic engineers who are uh, trying to help multiple companies in gaining more energy efficient process, more energy efficient sources, and uh, lower the CO2 emissions. We are on the market for 14 years and have a big, big number of projects running already in different, different branches for industry. Thank you. So thank you, Eric. Thank you, Piotr, uh, for this quick introduction. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so you all, you are all spending val very valuable time today in the webinar. And given most companies are also committed to ambitious sustainability and energy objectives, we have set ourselves a few objectives for this webinar. The first one is to give you a feeling and understanding of which technologies exist today to accelerate your energy efficiency improvements and to show you that there is potential everywhere in the operations. Secondly, um, we have, I, or the ambitious goal uh, comes most of the time with a lot of challenges, and we would like to zoom in on those challenges um, and highlight um, that you can reach certain objectives even with limited own resources. And thirdly, um, we want to give you a head start and show you uh, our roadmap in a very practical way. So um, now we would like to ask you to take your cell phone um, and go uh, to menti.com. Uh, in this next slide, you uh, can either use menti.com and use the access codes, or you can um, use the QR codes and um, scan it and then go through the questions. So we're all here with, with big challenges probably, and uh, we would like to see with the incentive why you are here. So how relevant is the topic of energy uh, to your company at the moment? Uh, it looks like it's stable, right? I see um, 22 people having uh, yeah. answered. Yes. Okay, but uh, fine. I think the 
let's let's assume the 22 are a more than representative sample of the group which is in the call. So this uh, this is interesting. It confirms a bit what we see uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, two year, well, we do this now since a few years, but a year ago after the the Ukraine war started, we had a lot of focus on risk of energy shortage. Shortage uh, that seems to be uh, a bit on the second uh, plan right now. But of course, the carbon neutrality objectives and uh, profitability, uh, that's also what we see. Uh, they remain uh, the key drivers for these um, energy projects. I think we can go to the second uh, question, Helen. Indeed, let's go to the second question. So um, probably you have some challenges. Um, this is probably also why you joined this, uh, this call and we would like to zoom in on those challenges. So which challenges, um, if you have any, do you encounter to ensure a rapid or an implementation. So, so first of all, the lack of in-house expertise, the lack of funding, CAPEX, to do these big projects sometimes uh, uh, with a big horizon. We'll zoom into that later also. Uh, the lack of lack of impactful projects. Maybe within the company there are competing decision criteria. So are we more about cost, more about carbon neutrality, more about energy efficiency? And the last one is about the different priorities um, of the company of production, uh, before, uh, for example, on site level versus corporate programs that are um, that are having competing uh, priorities. So, um, what what you uh, what what you say uh, the the audience in this call today is uh, the 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 main maybe challenges uh, to overcome uh, at this stage in your companies. I would phrase it like that lack of in-house expertise on the one hand uh, and I, I presume it, it means expertise uh, both expertise and also uh, um, capability huh? just engineering time available to do these projects and maybe also in engineering expertise we will actually come to that in this discussion also and that the competing priorities in production that's something also uh, we see uh, everywhere, right? The, nobody waited for the field of energy to all of a sudden pop up in our face like uh, so critical. And there are many more uh, objectives, uh, long term roadmaps in the production. I think it, we recognize those things. Uh, what we see is also often a uh, lack of impactful projects. It, it, you need to define the projects before you can start working on them. Um, but I think all in all, this uh, corresponds to what we see in in the in the in the in the clients whom we're working for today so in front of these challenges that's why we made really the partnership with deep energy we here we see uh what our experience is over the last years of the challenges we see in our customers and i think it corresponds rather well to uh what came out of this uh, poll as always uh, uh reasserting so the big challenge one i would say is the resources in short supply and there are three types of resources that we've witnessed uh, as uh, in short supply expert knowledge meaning the expertise to to see to see uh, what is the uh, what are the projects if you are uh, watching birds you need to know which bird you look for before you can see them so it's expert knowledge to see the projects engineering resources to elaborate the projects and capex budgets uh, in in uh, obvious right, the the field of energy came on top of everything else, uh, uh, like a meteorite uh, last year. Then uh, another type of challenges is uh, also came out of the poll is the the embarking the business, uh, aligning everybody on uh, uh, these these priorities. So it's stakeholder onboarding. The the projects they happen in the plans. They need to be embraced by the plans and uh, the. the they may there may be a top a top management drive to do things, but between there and between the operations, there's a long way and uh, many people need to be onboarded. Um, second one, analytics and digital. Uh, so uh, a, a way to to quickly see the projects and also quickly uh, uh, embrace uh, um, the, the daily improvement of energy is through analytics and digital. And in many cases, that is a challenge. And last but not least, the, the performance control system, the energy management 
uh, in place. So embedding it in the operations is a real challenge. So on the left column, I would say seeing it and having the resources on the right com column, everybody aligned and embedding it in the operations. And that's why you see the logo of DB Energy and the logo of Hazel Consulting with our partnership. We make that happen. And we will explain you in a minute how we do that. So the next speaker is uh, Piotr, who will expand on uh, identifying the opportunity, seeing what you need to see, and uh, then from there starting the the projects. I will stop sharing. Oh no, I can I can share. Just Piotr, tell me when I need to move. Of course. Thank you, Sama. Um, as I said, we are working with uh, industries and in, in the field of energy efficiency since a quite long time. So uh, we may say that we've been there before the EED directive. So the energy efficiency directive was there before all of the schemes to support energy efficiency were present on the market. Uh, this long presence um, actually provoke us to, to make a kind of uh, a bar scheme of what's possible and to show you how many times we did it. Uh, so to show that it's possible and it's doable and it's applicable in most of the companies that we are uh, that we are in. Of course, the, the long list of projects that that we present in here, this is only a, a small flavor of what's what's possible. Of course, we need uh, deeper analysis to check out what's there. Uh, but just to show you where are the main fruits of energy efficiency uh, on the next slides, we'll present some smaller ideas, probably possible to be done in every industry and some of the advanced technologies that we work with. Just to give you a, a, a snack of flavor, the, the main, of course, the main um, efficiency gains you can find in technological process. This is something that is quite often forgotten and the, there is a lot of discussion about the buildings envelope, there is a lot of discussion about HVAC, there is a lot of uh, different technologies that are surrounding the technological process, but as you can see on this bar scheme, most and the most uh, profitable things you can always find in technological process. Okay. Um, so what we can start with, just to uh, just to give you the, uh, the idea of, of uh, how we do it. First, and the basic uh, point of starting the uh, energy efficiency analysis in a walkthrough audit is something that we call the pinch. Pinch is a typical tool which is used to integrate the heat and cold around the factory. This is not exactly the uh, energy efficiency measure, but this is a tool to start the adventure of energy efficiency in your site. In most cases, companies don't have it. They, they are relying on the expert knowledge of the engineers, of the process engineers, but they don't have it. Um, the second topic that is quite um, usually omitted are the steam traps. This is a very small piece, but enables you to save something around one to two percent of steam and a lot of maintenance costs on the uh, steam traps uh, topic. The implementation is very short, capex is very small, payback also it's lower than six months. Typical problem of the steam traps is that the typical uh, site uses something between 500 to 1,000 steam traps, and this makes it difficult. Uh, what we also observe is the pressure and flow optimization uh, possibility. For most of the cases where you use the uh, constant flow pumps or vents, in, it is possible to save something around 20% uh, of the energy consumed by the pump or vent with a very small uh, period of implementation between one and two months. And typically, uh, if you have already VSD, it's no CAPEX, or if you don't, uh, it's only a small bit to put inside uh, the control system to ensure that the savings are there. Uh, also, the topic that is quite easy, and in many cases, it's also not there, is the lighting installation. We may uh, observe that in most companies, the lighting installation is already changed, replaced. Some of the companies replaced it very, very long time ago uh, for the old technology of LED. And this is also something that uh, you might find uh, uh, surprising. It is also a time 
that you can use new LEDs instead of old LEDs and you will still earn money on this and the savings will be quite fruitful. Typical implementation is five to eight months, CapEx depend of course on the size of the factory, but you can achieve around 80% of savings starting from metal hog and on car lamps and going to LEDs. Can you move to another slide? Sorry, I heard you, but my my computer doesn't help me in moving the slides. There we go. Yeah, we also uh, find a new solutions, or let's say more advanced solutions, uh, being more and more popular around the factories that we are uh, visiting. Uh, first point that comes after. Uh, after the start of the world of Ukraine is kind of a fuel energy resilience projects. This consists of uh, own energy sources and one of the most popular that we seen in 61 projects is combined heat and power. With different technologies, it can be on biomass, it can be on natural gas, uh, it's there. Annual savings per one megawatt is something around 400 500k. Uh, when switching from coal, which is still uh, kind of a case, it gives you savings on CO2 of around 40%. Implementation time is something between 12 and 40 months, and CapEx per one megawatt is something around 800k. Paybacks typically around two years. Uh, we also see advanced heat recovery projects. Why advanced heat recovery? Because now when you are using uh, different technologies for um, for the recovery and actually from conditioning of the heat that is being recovered, it is possible to use uh, streams of energy with low temperatures that were neglected in most cases because uh, you couldn't do uh, anything with it like five or six years ago. Now advanced heat recovery becomes more and more popular. Mm -hmm. Typical savings from the process are something between 20 and 30 percent. Implementation, depending on the size and what we are talking about, between two and ten months. And the capex is something around 300 to 400 k per megawatt of the recovered heat. Uh, we got also uh, gas turbines. Uh, gas turbines is also a fuel resilience project for, in most cases, for the ones who want to produce electricity on their own. And um, it becomes more and more uh, popular. The savings are around 15 to 20 percent of first steam in reference to classic approach of steam production of steam to power. Implementation between 12 and 18 months. Capex around 1 million euro per megawatt payback three to four years. And something that is quite uh, new on the market is high temperature heat pumps. Typically heat pumps are uh, uh, used for the low temperature uh, heat needs. So like two, three, four years ago, uh, nothing more than 40 to 50 Celsius degrees was possible to get on the heat pump. Now we are talking about technologies which allows us to use steam uh, as a uh, as a product of the heat pump with COP of around three to four. Um, in, the, in the next slides, I will show you also the, the case study from one of our customers with a almost 60 Celsius degrees heat pump, high capacity heat pump. But this is also the, the, the type of the projects that we can see more and more often in our uh, walkthroughs. Typical annual savings are something around 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and the best is when the downsource is a wet flue gas, so we can use the condensation heat exchanger. CO2 savings something around 30%, implementation 12 to 15 months. CAPEX is slightly higher, 1.5 to 2 million euro per megawatt, but the payback is really, really good. It's something that also enables fuel electrification process in the factory and is one of the steps for the roadmap of uh, zero emissive uh, factory or carbon neutral factory. Thank you. We can go further. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much, Piotr. I think it's amazing to see all these technologies and uh, there are even more. So thank you for this introduction. Um, bringing us to the topic of data analytics. So um, our FSO data analytics team in Belgium and the Netherlands is very strong in structuring the data and using Python AI, in fact, and in order to identify losses uh, on the one side and also to um, 
set up and implement dashboarding to monitor if you are um, if you are achieving the modeled gains. And so, for example, in the example that we run through uh, today, um, in less than a month, we have worked on an assignment for a big European coffee roaster producer. And we were asked to specifically look for and quantify the cost cutting opportunities related to energy within a specific um, scope of roasters using advanced uh, analytics. So I'm not going to elaborate strongly on this, but what we did and we have structured the data in relevant intervals and calculated the energy consumption uh, during production orders and when there are no production orders. And so, for example, these are two roasters following each other in the process. Um, you have the first roaster, the A, and then the B is the afterburner. And in the dark color or in the darker green, you see the gas usage. Um, and what you notice is in the first one that there is a pattern, meaning that the temperature were lowered uh, on the moments that there is no order. But in the secondly, this was not done. And so we aligned with quality uh, in order to lower the temperature when out of order of when when there was no production order for the second roaster. And so um, in this way, we could uh, make uh, substant substantial um, uh, gains from lowering the temperature and less using um, energy. So if we click once more, then we see uh, what it brought uh, for this company, only this one site in the European Union, 15% of CO2 gains and a potential of two to three million savings per year, only for this site. And this could be elaborated um, to or applicated to other, um, to other sites within the, the European Union. And um, let's move to the next topic um, where we will zoom a bit more into detail on the approach on the how. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so indeed, uh, how did we bring it all together? I think we we have been uh, together with uh, our partner DB Energy looking at all the challenges our client face. We've done uh, projects uh, to, to confront them and then we came up with um, a pragmatic approach which really, uh, and I'm going to show it and I will explain it, bear with me a minute so I go from left to right, but the pragmatic approach where we all have everything you need in one hand. Uh, dealing with the CapEx challenges in many uh, companies and dealing with the competing uh, objectives in production in many companies, we think it's important that you quickly can focus all minds on the most impactful projects so that there is no impression of time wasted and various and that the limited means, be it uh, engineering skills or be it uh, production management time or be it CapEx can be focused rapidly. So we have developed and we practice it now since uh, two years, the um, this three step approach where step one is uh, produce as quickly as possible and as light as possible the long list of the energy saving projects. So we call that the, the plant walkthrough. Uh, what is what is it? It, it requires two of our specialists to spend two days on the site, on the production site, uh, do some upfront data gathering, spend time in the control room and visit the installations, do some post processing. Basically, in one week time, there is a long list of energy saving projects with already high level business cases business cases plus minus 30 percent and that is possible because as you as Piotr explained we have done so many projects that we can very quickly uh, estimate what what they can mean in the production so after one week there is a go no go moment uh, either we transfer it from there to the client uh, because uh, some clients have then the in-house engineering teams to take it further up or we co we continue so we present a long list which is like a menu with options, a heat map uh, out of 30 or 40 options, our clients then choose the three or four or 10 most impactful projects for which we do then a phase two, which is the concept design. Then uh, our specialists go on site again the second time, visit the production, discuss with the production engineers the, the specific implantation, do the feasibility assessment, contact some suppliers to get the, the, the recent price quotes. And basically in a few days, up to a few tens of days, depending of course on the complexity of the project, we uh, prepare the projects for EPC. EPC uh, stands for Engineering Procurement Contracting, which is the actual building of the, 
of the installation. Then again come a go no go moment. Uh, where normally the business cases uh, usually look better than uh, after the heat map even. So then a choice needs to be made traditionally and that's option one traditionally the the large industrial companies for whom we work have in-house engineering uh, and and so when the the capex required is not too high and the engineering skills are not too intensive and the payback is reasonable then typically they would choose for option one which is do the uh, epc in-house and on their existing capex budgets and realize the project however what we see uh, more and more is that um, first of all these projects can take uh, lots of uh, manpower but especially also uh, there may be a, a, a payback challenge so the projects can take uh, can require millions of euro of investments as piotr explained uh, but also uh, large industrial groups these days have short payback requirements, paybacks of two, three, whatever, four years, uh, which would qualify out uh, some of the most impactful energy projects, whereas there are, of course, uh, professional investors for whom a payback of four years is, is perfect. So that's why we have developed the ESCO uh, construction, energy savings contract or energy savings construction or company, how you call it, which is a way through which third party financing is involved in uh, the project. So basically, uh, let me give a quick example and Piotr will explain in more detail. Instead of having your project with a payback of four years, uh, with an investment of 10 million euros and a payback of four years, it will be financed through uh, an energy savings company with a third party uh, professional investor in this field. And it will become maybe a project uh, of eight years uh, payback. Uh, oh, sorry, four, four years payback. But uh, it will the contract will last eight years, and you will not invest one euro. The investment is fully done by the ESCO and with the third party financing, and the savings are shared from day one. So basically, the payback becomes zero. You have you don't have to make a capex investment, and you will have. 40% uh, of the savings right away, and then after a, a certain number of years, the installation is transferred. So with these two options, we can really handle both the small and easy projects and both the complex projects with longer paybacks and make it possible, which is really what it's all about today. In parallel with this three-step approach, and that's at the bottom of the slide, there is the data analytics track, which Helen explained, and the program and change management, which I didn't really mention a lot, but which is uh, to connect all the dots, how to make sure that corporate priorities are transformed into projects in the operations and everybody aligned around those projects. I will now pass the word again to Piotr, who will take you through a specific example, one example. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope to do it very quickly. I would like to show you the quite complex project of uh, one of our customers uh, done in ESCO model. The customer is uh, working in the field of food and beverage. Uh, the key operation is agility and flexibility with high respect to quality of the product and uh, the necessity to tackle the mid-low range of costs and emissions. And uh, of course, energy is one of the key figures in the, in the field. So I, I will give you the general numbers, the energy consumption around 70 gigawatt hours, uh, both electricity and gas. Uh, capex of the investment, 7 million euro, uh, more or less. Uh, CO2 reduction around 10,000 tons a year. Energy consumption reduction, uh, depending on the time of the year, but something between uh, 38 and 48 percent. Payback, four years, so not possible to be done with the uh, 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 typical uh, company uh, capex lifetime of the installation at least 16 years and there were some of the general problems uh, first of all small on-site team mainly focused on the technology of the production no own engineering resources on the site no own investment team on the site and the biggest issue capex lockup for three-year budget so even if you would find something it would need to be written down in the capex and done in the fourth year of the uh, of the living of the company. So for the three years, they would looking on the savings and it would be not possible to uh, to get them. 
Next slide, please. So what was the what was the investment? It was quite complex. It started with a small heat recovery that we were asked to assess. And then it occurred that uh, using the condensation heat exchanger, we could uh, go for the heat pump and uh, make the whole uh, investment better and uh, uh, much, much, much more efficient. But then it of, of course occurred that, okay, if you have the heat pump, we need the electricity source, which is going to be stable and resilient for the uh, price movements on the market. So we came up with an idea, okay, so let's put a CHP source inside. Then of course, when we run uh, slowly through the site, it occurred that parts of the uh, main process should be replaced because of the age. It was 20 year old vents, uh, very big. And of course, uh, uh, at the end, it occurred that still the refrigeration system, which could be connected with the heat pumps, uh, could be also replaced and the gains would be even bigger. Uh, on the top, we put also a SCADA to control the uh, production process and to gather all of the installations in one point to be able to assess the, the savings and to have a better understanding of what's going on. Typical numbers are on the right. Uh, what is really worth mentioning, the COP of the heat pump, 363, and the delta temperature from the condensation heat exchanger of around, in average, through the year 19 Celsius to 57. This is something that is quite unique uh, for the market. The site located uh, in Poland, so uh, with a really rough uh, conditions, uh, atmospheric conditions, and uh, the numbers are really, really good. Can we go to another slide? And so how we how we did it? Uh, it was all done in ESCO model. The, the customer, as I said, had the lockup for uh, for the investment budget for capex. And uh, what we settled is the the key uh, of the energy efficiency process that we can see now in the uh, in the industry. Industries are mainly focused on the production uh, or replacing of all of the things that you've seen on the previous slide, we get nine days of the stoppage of the production. So during nine days, we had to replace two huge vents, put all of the pipes, put the heat exchanger on top of the uh, of the dryer, make everything connected so the customer could run the process and we could connect all of the other things outside. Um, what was typical? Um, he wanted to have the savings from the first point, and this is very, very good. In long-term financing, we can finance things from five to 15 years periods. And of course, this, this covers 100% of the, of the cost. What about the remuneration? The remuneration could be done um, in a multiple ways. Uh, what is quite unique, we can go with full success fee. So we don't need any warranties on the process. If the customer ensures his own uh, production and his own typical uh, risks that we have at the at this time. Uh, as Eric said, our client achieves the savings within the first year once the project is launched. Payback is immediate. When you don't have the costs and you have the savings, uh, ERR is uh, uh, not countable. The fixed assets are owned by DB Energy and uh, this can go through whole of the operation of the uh, of the contract and what is the most uh, important for the lockups of capex and for the um, uh, different financial solutions it can be of balance according to ifrs 16. so we got uh, the ideas how to do it in a way that it will not influence the balance sheet of the of the plan of course every time it requires uh, discussion with the accounting and finance team of the customer, but it's possible. And how it's done? Can we put another one? Uh, first of all, of course, we need to have the money, but the money are uh, on our side. So we have the agreements with financing institutions. We are getting financing and we are repaying the, uh, the fees to the financial institution. And the next one. And where's the customer? The customer got uh, everything which is uh, going on on the side. So we design, implement, and launch the, the investment. Of course, we can deliver also the, the optional warranty on technical effect, uh, which we can both uh, uh, do. And uh, the remuneration can be fully savings driven. So if there is no savings, we don't get the money. Of course, if the customer will shut down the plant, 
we need to have something to know that uh, that it's not the, the plan. Uh, but in general, on the customer side can be every benefit that you can imagine. And on the ESCO side and the financing institution can be all of the risks of the new technologies, implementation, uh, scheduling, etc. So this is all possible within one stop shop. So we can identify, design, prepare, make the APC and then finance the, uh, the project. We can go to our lot. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. That brings us to the conclusion of the of the webinar. Of course, there is still time for questions and answers. I see I have to switch on my camera. So that brings us, as I said, to the conclusion. Now um, we hope uh, to have convinced you that uh, such an energy track can be made simple. That's what we try to do and that we do it under one hand uh, as uh, my friend Piotr also said, from the defining the uh, impactful projects in a quick walkthrough all the way to the realization and the financing. So to make it easy for our clients to realize those projects. Now, maybe as a last uh, concluding slide, when to do it, when to do it. Uh, a year ago, uh, we, we saw all these uh, uh, stressful situations where there was a risk of not having gas supply and an exploding gas price. Uh, electricity prices exploded. In meanwhile, they both have come down again. For how long, we don't know. Uh, one thing is sure, the CO2 prices will keep on going up and will by themselves um, drive drive the, the cost equation. And electricity prices, we also expect them to go up and drive the cost equation. So I think uh, projects like this that take many years to implement, uh, there is no, uh, I would say, reason to wait if, of course, they can be uh, translated into good into good business cases, uh, which hopefully our ESCO model uh, delivers uh, to many of you. So with that, I'm going to thank you for having participated already. And uh, maybe um, I think the questions are in the chat, which I yes. don't see. So I will uh, let yep. Glenn manage that. No worries. Uh, thank you very much, Piotr and Eric, uh, for this very clear overview. I see a lot of uh, questions and let me dive into uh, one of them. Um, Hendrik van Gils, um, you can also unmute yourself and maybe ask the question out loud. Out loud. Um, to Piotr, I think this will be the question. Yes, indeed. So thank you, uh, Piotr. It's very interesting to see also some uh, some examples and some fields of application. I, I had two questions actually. I, w I was uh, wondering about the, uh, the 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 pump flow optimization part that you showed. Uh, how to achieve savings here, uh, keeping in mind all the the process parameters and the flexibility expected from from production. Okay. Uh, yeah, coming from steel industry myself, uh, that's that's one important uh, topic that is always at hand. Second, uh, second question was: I saw this picture on the uh, the waste heat applications with an application that looked like uh, uh, steel industry. Uh, I was interested what it what it was. Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe maybe the first one um, for the flows optimization. What we can see, and this is quite popular, uh, when the installation is being designed, most of the designers, and probably there is uh, like three of them uh, working in a row, they're adding some, let's say, safeguards to the process. And when it's on the, on the design level, it's very useful because they are sure that it's going to work at the end. So if they need to cover, I don't know, the, the pressure drop of uh, two megapascals, so the pumps and the installation that you have uh, probably on your side will easily run to an a five, to an a seven, to an a eight. And what our optimization can do is to take the real values that you really need in the production, measure it, and then control the the pump or the vent to really achieve the the parameters you need. So one is the spec that we got from you on the technological process, and the second is to use the uh, the thresholds that are used by, by the designers on the design stage uh, that in the real life makes it, of course, operate for sure, 
but in most cases uh, they don't care about the money because they only interested in to have it running and and this is the this is the way where we can find uh, the savings it's very popular on, on most of the uh, most of the power plants this is the over pressure of the of the feed water pumps for boilers many boilers run on 130 bars 140 bars and the over pressure on the pump you can see it's 190 so they have really really huge possibility of gaining savings and of course we can achieve the robustness and everything that is needed from the technological point of view uh, with the new technologies we can use the overflows we can use the uh, the dynamic bsds it's it's uh, a lot a lot of new technologies that are uh, coming in and which is most significant for most of the businesses that we that we visited uh, for instance, most of the VSDs are the voltage driven ones, which are quite, uh, let's say, good for small drives, but for the big drives, the current ones should be used. And this is something that uh, that we saw and that we implemented many times. And, and uh, just a small switch from the understanding of the technology brings really new possibilities for the for the business. Uh, for the um, uh, for the heat recovery. To be honest, we did a uh, lot of different projects for steel industry, and most of them are the heat recoveries from the uh, from the smelter houses, so from the smelting uh, furnaces, starting with uh, with aging furnaces, uh, finishing on the big furnaces like the blast furnaces for the uh, for the uh, heat recovery of the flue gas with the dusting and conditioning of the flue gas and all of the things that are covering mainly the problems with heat exchanges on this high temperature and very aggressive environment. Uh, so I, I can I can give you an overview uh, directly on email of the projects that we did for uh, steel industry. So you can maybe find something that matches your uh, uh, your idea and your, your, your problems. Yeah, thank you. Very, thank you. Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there was one. There was one question on the beginning that was very uh, interesting because of the ESG reporting. Uh, I can see it. It's from uh, Jean Marc, uh, and sorry for pronouncing probably Giro, Giro. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, about the client who asked about the reporting of CO two emission savings. Which company gets to record the savings in the ESG report? Actually, both. And this is something fantastic because when you uh, lower your emissions, uh, you are mainly lowering it uh, in the scope one and two, and then your customer is lowering the scope three when he buys from you the uh, the product or sub product that is uh, already uh, let's say energy efficient or CO two neutral or close to neutral, whatever we, we will find. So you can report it on one and two, and he will report it on the scope three. So. It's a win-win situation, typically. <clears throat> and uh, we can go lower. Uh, I don't see the questions, uh, so Piotr and uh, Glenn, you have well, well, I see we are also at the end of the webinar, right? so let me take one more question uh, of Jeffrey, and um, I will read it out loud. Um, how do you convince your customer to start capturing the data without having an ROE on itself? It's only the foundation to define projects and estimate corresponding ROEs, but it doesn't save you energy in itself. Um, so it was a response on the data analytics track. Um, so in this case, and, and please uh, um, just um, Fill me in, uh, um, Piotr and Eric, if you want to uh, add something. But by looking at th th this customer, their energy bill and the increase in the past years due to the market situations, well, there there was a business case to to do the sensors and to uh, implement these sensors, and they had an increase and a significant increase in costs. So this was a motivation to look for saving opportunities, and so this was a discussion with some technical uh, personnel in the area uh, where there could be potential and. So they scoped very fast these burners, um, and then a decision was made very, very easily uh, to invest in this hardware, these sensors to be uh, installed in this specific scope of um, of the company. Yeah, you would also make a macro loss analysis eh, on what is the energy strictly needed for your process and what is the energy actually consumed. And based on that, you can also justify uh, installing RFID or the, the measurements. It's an iterative process if you want. 
Good, good. Uh, Glenn, you said this would be this is the end of the call. I would so I I presume there are no more burning questions. There are a few questions from Jean Marc, but let uh, let us take them up um, just of outside this webinar and then make sure that you have the answer to the questions and everybody um, sees these questions and sees also the the response to it. So thank you so, very much, Piotr and Eric. Thank you, Thank so you much. to everybody who was in this call. Uh, hopefully it leads to uh, us all together uh, saving more energy and saving more CO2. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch.